Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah Marie Garcia. I'm really grateful to the Wayford and Edwards Festival for gathering our sustained community today on Regent's land. Um, I typically live and work um, on Denina lands in Anchorage, Alaska, um, but I'm coming to Wayford today from a very interdisciplinary background in my research and education, and also my worldviews. Uh, my grandmother is from the Rosewood Sioux tribe. My dad is Hispanic in heritage, um, and I have been living in Anchorage for about a year, but lived in a number of places all over the lower 48 and come to this work with a passion to really work in the nexus of environmental science, policy, and communities. And so I really liked how, how Rick left us off with the fact that we all have an active role and a need to participate in this work in addressing climate change. Um, and so I'm really excited today to share more about the Indigenous Sentinels Network. It's the program that I help coordinate. I work for the Alley community of St. Paul Island's tribal government in our ecosystem conservation office. And the Indigenous Sentinels Network has been a program that we've been helping to lead and, and grow over the past more than 20 years now um, to really have this indigenous led and community based monitoring programs exist all across the state and not just on St. Paul. Next slide. But I still like to take a moment and talk about the origins, and I'd like to invite you all to join me in, in going to St. Paul right now from this slide. Um, St. Paul Island is about 40 square mile island in the middle of the Bering Sea. It's one of the peripheral off islands, St. George and St. Paul, um, and we're considered one of the most important seabird nesting sites in the Bering Sea. Um, so needless to say, we have a ton of vital cultural species on our island, including northern fur seals, stellar sea lions, and both islands have portions of our um, ecosystem in the Alaska Maritime National Refuge within their land base. And so our community has deep ties to our environment and stewarding those environments and bringing in their knowledge to help um, increase decisions and improve decisions around our resource management on the island. And we've been using the Indigenous Sentinels Network as a tool to um, help with northern fur seal management. Um, and we've been evolving with the technology and the community needs to really help address other species monitoring in our region and across the state. Um, next slide. And so, as I said, we've been kind of operating for more than 20 years. So this slide kind of gives you an idea of our expansion. Um, again, beginning in the early 2000s on our, as our Island Sentinel program, really just focusing on monitoring resources on our island. Um, that still continues today. We have three full-time employees in our office that do surveys on a daily basis um, for our resources. We went from using right in the rain notebooks to collecting environmental surveys to then shifting to PDA systems and creating our own online database where all of our information is secured and community owned. Um, and then we expanded beyond just northern fur seals. Community members were asking, well, will it work for rat prevention and invasive species monitoring? And then neighboring islands along the Aleutian asked about using it for their communities and monitoring marine mammals or seabird research. And so we've expanded throughout the years to really look at this broad um, perspective of diverse monitoring efforts across the state. Next slide. So this kind of is an arbitrary map of where we were existing um, or where we're operating right now. We've been, like I said, expanding from St. Paul. We were formerly called the Baron Watch Program. <laughs> if those in the room are familiar with that um, old name. That really reflected where we were operating back in the day in the Barrett Sea region. But since we've been expanding in the southeast and across the state and working with um, Tananan Chief Conference and TCDs across the state, we've really become this, um, the Indigenous Sentinels Network and have sustained that growth since the early 1990s and really just showcasing the importance of building out these efforts and empowering communities to do coordinated, community driven, and Indigenous led environmental monitoring. Next slide. Um, a lot of the next couple slides after this go into kind of the nitty gritty technical data analysis. We talk about our apps, but I wanted to show you this um, kind of abstract graphic that was the result of conversations that we've had with communities in the Northern Bering Sea. We have a grant recently um, from the North Pacific Research Board that allowed us to explore ways to expand ISN and empower communities to conduct environmental monitoring in the Northern Bering Sea region. And from that grant, we were able to have a series of eight dialogues with representatives from communities around that region. And these in the next few images are results from those dialogues where we went through mapping and kind of, we call it a constellation exercise. So even though it's not just about where next um, ISN is operating, it's also about that network and understanding the connections between these communities and how ISN has the ability to 
have real-time data collected at the community and local scale to help communities grapple with the shifts that they're seeing in their environment or monitoring their species, but also the ability to share across these regions and really track all these events that we're seeing. Um, next slide. And so it's it's kind of this takeaway where I wanted to quote one of our elders in those conversations that um, research is very similar to kin making and how kin making is developing those strong and lasting meaningful relationships to really bring together and blend and braid Western science with local knowledge and the historical and local context with all of this data that's gathering and how that can help strengthen ties and really bring us together when we're trying to grapple with all of the challenges we're seeing in climate change. So really, um, ISN's mission statement is to support that collection of indigenous, local, and traditional knowledge and braid that with um, Western science methods, so collecting that in tandem with Western science data points and information to, in order to empower that ecosystem and community-centered resource management decision-making. So having the whole picture, both local community context, come into play when we're making these decisions at multiple levels. Rick mentioned the importance of having these data sets of on a broad scale, but making sure that it can work on the local level too, to address real-time needs. Next slide. Uh, next, next, next. Um, yeah, you can just go through the two more. Okay. <laughs> Remnants from um, another presentation. Uh, but really, again, reiterating that the goal is to give remote communities a tool. At its heart, ISN is a tool and it's a software database that communities can use to report information and communicate that broadly. Um, the two foundations that we've been developing and that are rooted in all of our programs and throughout our expansion is really that traditional ecological knowledge, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and Western science are not either or, just different sides of the same point and both very vital to include in our decision making so that we have a complete and holistic perspective. And really that successful conservation efforts must include local communities. Um, we operate in the thinking that without local buy-in, most conservation efforts are doomed. Uh, I think most in this room know that if we launch projects, if we're not involving the community member, the sustainability of those projects will fill the launch researcher seat. And so making sure community members are at the heart of everything that we do and designing these monitoring efforts is a foundation in my sense. We really also help address data issues. Um, you know, with citizen science, it's it's shown that rigorous monitoring efforts with citizen science or communities is really capable of covering that geographical and um, temporal scale that is often unreachable by academic researchers. And so being able to have methods and, and a way for ISN to help guide communities to address data quality and making sure that those data collection efforts still meet standards um, is something that we help build into a lot of our programs. We also address data ownership. Um, this was originally started on St. Paul, and so the original foundation of ISN was rooted in the fact that St. Paul wanted to own our data. We wanted to make sure that we had the ability to share specific types of information, such as the population counts of our northern fur seals, but maybe not um, some of the local knowledge that our hunters were creating. So the platform has the ability to share needed information, but also protect other information that communities identify as something that they want to keep private and within their communities. So the main components of ISN um, really are those online database and this collection of mini apps. Um, so ISN is an application in an online database, and then we have a series of mini apps that can be used on cell phones, tablets, um, that kind of guide users through, and I'll walk through an example later of what that would look like. Uh, but all of our applications can be used without Wi-Fi or cell signal. So a huge thing in Alaska when we're often operating in these remote and rural areas. And then the database um, is also privacy protected and password controlled, again, giving communities access and control over who's being able to see their information. We have communication tools. We provide training materials, so helping communities learn how to use these tools. We also support in grant writing and technical support. So we help communities fund these projects um, and also start to provide like essential jobs for people in their um, IGAP programs or for St. Paul, we have three folks um, from the community hired in our community to do this kind of survey work. And we also help with partnership develop, again, building out that network. So I'm gonna run through kind of an example of what this would look like to use one of our tools. Um, the example I'm gonna use here is if I was a hunter on St. Paul and I'm about to go out and do a marine mammal harvest and what I would, type of information I would collect. But 
So most of our apps, like I said, are, are password protected and privacy controlled. So it's, it's not necessarily that you can go on, download, and start immediately using it. We normally set up, you have to be part of a community, we give you your login and password. And then when you log in, you have your general landing pages. So it's very akin to a paper environmental survey, just something that can be used on your phone and accessed by almost any community member that you want to engage with for doing this kind of work. Um, so you'll always start out with filling out general information. We collect environmental conditions and then specific <laughs> harvest details. So where they were harvested, struck and lost, if they're taking measurements or biosampling, we also have the ability to track that in our software as well. And then we have the ability to do images and then audio recordings as well. So um, we've gotten a lot of feedback over the past few years for people just wanting to document oral history. So outside of the marine mammal, we have the ability to just do audio, save your database, and then that audio file gets transcribed for the communities. So that's a cool innovation over the past two years. But if I was still on, on St. Paul and doing this harvest, um, I'd log in and the general information is related to the community. So if you're part of St. Paul's community, you know, their options will show up um, as St. Paul. Um, if you're not part of that community, then you could be doing a marine mammal harvest maybe in the Prince William Sound or Chugach Regional Resource Commission. We work with them so that there are communities within this harvest database. Um, I'm going out to harvest the seal. Um, often on island two, uh, we go out in pairs of two. So Aaron is doing the actual hunting, so he's observer one, and I'm maybe just doing the dive entry. So you have the ability to track how many people are involved in this work as well, which can be helpful for grant reporting in terms of justifying why you need these people collecting this data. And then, of course, start and date the end, end time of like, when the hunt happens. We also collect environmental conditions. So anything from weather, sea state, was it sunny or snowy? Was it that kind of context, local scale um, weather information? Weather methods. So on St. Paul, we normally pull our information from the Davis Weather Station, but you can also have options where it was an on-site estimate. I was just gauging how fast the wind was going while I was out there. Next slide. And then location information. Even without Wi-Fi, the the software and the programs have the ability to pull a GPS point directly from the device. So that's helpful for GIS analysis later on. Um, and then we get into the harvest details. So species information. So I'm harvesting a bearded seal here. Um, so it's a marine mammal, but we also have a, a database and lists of birds, fish, um, plants, and, and um, we build out those database with communities of what they might think is um, appropriate to monitor. Um, is it present? It's sex, age class, um, how many you harvested next. Also the conditions and behaviors of the animal. Was it lactating? Was it pregnant? Was it oiled? Um, kind of collecting that kind of information as well for the conditions and behaviors of the species next. Um, where it was located, so additional details. Um, you know, it was on sea ice. It was stationary when I was observing it. Also the trend period. So this was maybe for this example, it was the first one I'd seen this month. And so kind of getting the population dynamic information as well. Next. So that's kind of what it would look like um, running through. I want to also emphasize that while we are using apps and smartphones, it's not the only way we get information into the system with communities. I still have a lot of folks using paper form, and then they have a designated person maybe within their conservation office digitizing those and saving it in a database. Or we also have communities that do um, group uh, community observations with sticky notes and mapping, and then we digitize all that and have that saved in and, and a safe and secure place for the communities as well. Next slide. Um, so essentially, how, how is this data being used? We're building out these robust data sets with communities. And so I'm going to provide some example of how St. Paul has used our marine mammal monitoring data in the past and some of the power um, in doing this work with communities and allowing them to collect this information. Um, Yes, so this um, graphic comes from uh, data collected from the Eco Office in 2017 on St. Paul, and it was used in, in actually validating the modeling um, done by a NOAA office um, about the timing of departure of fur seals um, in their mi winter migration pattern and the influences that cl climate and weather have on that. And so the model estimate is in blue. So NOAA has these model estimates of when northern pups will be arriving and departing on the island between October and December. And so it's just an estimate based on historical data. And we're actually to, able to ground truth those model estimates with our local data. Um, the triangles and the black solid line is actually data points from our um, marine mammal harvesters on island. And also you'll notice there's that dip in the graph um, and we're actually able to not just ground truth, but provide that local context for why there's that dip in, in some of the model estimates. 
And so um, the quote here in the local context provided was that the surf was pounding up against the cliffs, and so most of the seals were out in the water. So the counts for that set trend period in that season would be low. Um, so it just shows you the power of really having um, some of this help with co-management work, providing model estimates and ground truthing some of the research data with local observations as well. This is um, a long list, um, so it's a little tech heavy on this slide, but really the main point I wanted to emphasize is that um, the necessary co-management and governance structures um, that our data sovereignty protocols that are built within ISN allow us for this dynamic and equitable exchange of information between NOAA and our community members and have allowed us to really build out a robust co-management monitoring program on the island. Um, we've moved on from just doing subsistence harvest monitoring to where we also do daily biosampling. We handle marine and entanglement surveys on the island. We do arrival counts, pup departures, and so on. And so it really shows the amount um, of the information that our communities are able to collect um, and are very capable to collecting and providing that information. Um, and so I'll start to wrap up here with just emphasizing that I get walk through a lot of examples of what we do on St. Paul, how some of the tools are used, but this, this slide summarizes a few select and ongoing projects that we have within the network. And so um, my colleague Fiji is going to talk about skipper science here um, in the next two uh, slides, but we also work right now with developing a marine mammal har harvesting program and Prince William Sound, working with the Chugach Regional Resource Commission. So having them kind of model what we've been doing on St. Paul, but in the Prince William Sound region. Uh, we also do coastal erosion monitoring with multiple communities. Uh, we use sea duck and gull surveys and also work very close in partnership with the host team. Julie Garish will present next on that. Um, and we have a lot of emerging conversations, as you heard from Bill yesterday, um, and, and programs potentially coming out with the Yabi Village Council. Um, and we also partner with state and federal governments. Uh, we have a Fish Map Act program that's working with uh, the fish and game. In co-production, we developed a method basically to develop a tool that helps them fill in their anatomous waters catalog. So the state um, fish and game is charged with documenting all the streams that would potentially have anatomous fish. Um, as we all know, our state is vast, and I don't think there's enough tech hands in fish and game to cover all those regions. And so our tool helps empower trappers, hunters, anyone on the land to really say, hey, I know there's an anadrous fish spawning in this stream. I'm going to take this tool, get a picture of the fish in hand, the GPS point, and then that will automatically put it into a fillable PDF and send that to Fish and Game for a nomination. So it streamlined the process. And we launched that last year. Um, and we got about, I think, 13 nominations in just from that one pilot last summer. And so it's really working in collaboration um, and really kind of pushing the boundaries of our conventional management structures and trying to really work to grapple with all of these real-time data. Um, and so we've been operating for over 20 plus years, but technology is continuing to advance. And so we're actually really excited that in the next year, we're gonna be going through an expansion and rebuild. And that's been really guided by what communities want, um, some conversations about increasing you know, data privacy and um, sovereignty improvements. And so we're, working with developers right now um, to really increase um, push notification. So two-way conversation, again, building out those communication channels better within the software. Um, we're enhancing the GIS capabilities of our platform too. So doing some real-time mapping, which will be really excited, um, exciting for some of the communities that was, have requested that. Um, and we're also working on building out our robust internet payment methods. So Part of ISN and some of our programs and what we push a lot of our grant funding to work for us is making sure that communities are compensated for this work. We pay researchers and scientists to do this, and so a number of our programs also ensure that um, whether it's a pay per observation, so information that's submitted, there could be a payment kickback. So we're building out that funding stream as well within the program. And then again, the data sovereignty and being able to physically track after a community download a report where that information goes and, and providing a service to have them really track who's sharing what. Um, that's something that we're going to be exploring in the rebuild. Um, so I just want to wrap up with one of my favorite quotes and an emphasis that I never thought I would be an app technology or design when I <laughs> an environmental scientist. Um, but I think at the heart of it, it's this evolution and this need to really find innovative and, and clever ways to address the needs that we have with whether it's downscaling these great climate trends to the local level and also including more voices and braiding together local knowledge and traditional knowledge in with Western science and data. And so this comes from 
Um, you may, some of you may be familiar with it, but braiding sweetgrass. Um, and it really says, to be heard, you must speak the language of the one you want to listen. Science and traditional knowledge may ask different questions and speak different languages, but they may converge when both truly listen. And I think in my experience working with ISN and the talking with communities and seeing the power of this tool, I think this tool can really be something that can help facilitate that listening and that communication across communities and with Western So that's that. Next slide. Over 20 years, we've been, had a lot of funders and collaborators to think. Um, this is just a short list. Um, but um, with that, I'll say Koyana, and this is my information. We have open up for questions. We have time for one very short question. <laughs> Uh, what work do you do with um, schools? We are actually, you know, we are open to it um, completely. I mean, we work for pretty closely with our Barency campus on St. Paul. Yeah. But there's actually been a lot of interest with the Fish Map app and some high school teachers like actually saying it, this could be a great way for our students to go out and use the thing. So work is coming. I, I'd be glad to chat afterwards and chat more about schools. Yeah. <laughs> Right on time, though. Yeah. Oh, I really messed up, didn't I? So I think you can click on the not okay. links. Right. Hi, my name is Julia Parrish, and I um, come to you from the University of Washington, Seattle, was on Coast Salish lands. Um, and I am going to continue Rick's depressing song. <laughs> but I'm gonna move into um, gonna move into birds, uh, and I want to um, uh, do that by uh, thinking about the natural history of birds, and in particular, um, the natural history of dead birds. And I want to convince you that uh, they speak to us um, even when they're only physically. And I'm going to do that um, by talking about the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, which is a, a um, citizen science program. And here I want to distinguish a little bit the difference between citizen science and community science. Community science comes from community. It is by, with, and for community. Citizen science is a, a slightly different beast uh, where there are lots of people from different places um, interacting together across space and time to produce a data-driven result. So citizen science and community science can work hand in glove, but I want to respect um, community science and not run over that. So I want to um, say citizen science, and I just want to acknowledge that and say that out loud. Coast is a citizen science. So um, Coast documents dead birds, and here are some um, reasons, depending on where you are in the world, there actually can be quite a lot of dead uh, birds, and of course they were once alive. Um, and unlike live birds, a dead bird can be identified by anybody, and that's because you don't have to sneak up on them um, or have lots of expensive, fancy equipment like binoculars or spotting scopes um, or cameras with different lenses. I mean, also you don't have to get up particularly early in the morning. Um, to find a dead bird, you can just wander along the beach and find one like this one. And also, unlike live birds, a dead bird can be very easily photographed by anybody. Um, and that's because you can brush the sand off and you can actually pose them. Um, they can fill the frame. And certainly, if we only found one or two or three, that might not tell us a lot. But collectively, if we can get a lot of people doing this work, we can find hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands. 
So this is the COAST program. It's been going for uh, a few decades. Um, we range from Mendocino, which is in the southern part of Northern California, if that makes sense to you, along the Lost Coast, up the um, West Coast, uh, along all of Oregon and the outer coast of Washington. And we whip into the strait and inside waters of the Salish Sea. We have a sister program in BC, so we skip over uh, BC, that's British Columbia Beach Bird Survey, we pick up in Southeast. We run through the Gulf of Alaska and out the Aleutians, actually all the way to the Commander Islands in Russia, hop over the Alaska Peninsula into Bering, up to Chukchi, and um, up around the corner. So um, lots of places. Currently, we have about 380 sites in the program. We live in about 90 coastal communities. Um, we're pushing up towards 100,000 carcasses found of lots of different species. Um, and right now, today, as I stand here talking to you, we have about 780, give or take, folks in the program. We've trained about 5,000 people, and here's just something about the demographics. So what do you do in the Coast Program? We have a beach bird program, and we also have a marine debris program. I won't talk about marine debris today, um, but just beach birds. Um, so in regular Coast monthly surveying, um, we train people in community, and we ask them to go out monthly, search a beach, um, and look for carcasses. And when they find carcasses, uh, they collect evidence. And here's the evidence. They figure out what type of foot it is. So just simply counting the toes and looking at the arrangement and seeing whether uh, the feet are webbed or lobed or three-toed tells you a lot about what that bird is. And also, coincidentally, this is part of the natural history, the shape of the foot tells you about how that bird made its living, which is really cool. <laughs> so foot type. Um, they make three measurements. One is of the foot, one is of the outer part of the wing, and the third one is of the bill. Uh, and those measurements also help us figure out uh, what the identity of the bird is. So those are the basic um, data or the evidence. Um, there's a lot of uh, evidence that they also collect about the condition of the carcass which body parts are there, which parts aren't there, where the carcass is found on the beach. Okay, and then they use a field guide to figure out what uh, um, species identity and actually sort of female, juvenile, or adult is. And it doesn't look like this, like we should do. <laughs> it looks like this in Alaska, so we actually have three field guides so long after I have passed away, nobody will read my geeky science papers. Um, but my field guides will probably still be in print. We have one to Alaska, one to the West Coast, and we actually have one to the Northeast um, uh, in uh, the Atlantic. Okay. Um, and here's how to figure out the identity of a dead bird using the Coast Field Guide in three easy steps. The first thing is you figure out the uh, foot type. So what's the foot type family? And you go to the foot type key and you answer the questions until you come to a stop sign. And that tells you uh, what foot type family. This is the page for alcids. That's the part of the foot type family in the guide. They're alphabetical for alcids first and one for last. Um, and then you answer a few more questions until you get to a box with a stop sign. And that takes you to a species page. And then you can compare your evidence that you have in your data sheet to what's in the stop sign. So pretty easy to do. And I guarantee that we can train you in five hours, even if you're not very sure about birds at all. So walking into a, a regular coast training, which is a five hour training, one thing that we ask people when they fill in a uh, participant profile form, something about them, is what they think their level of expertise is in identifying birds. And over the entire program, about 15% of folks say, I'm an expert, or I'm, you know, I'm an advanced level bird identification, but about half the people who walk into a training are far, far more cautious than that. They say, well, I'm a beginner with respect to bird ID, and a few of them in that green wedge say, I don't have any experience at all, which makes me think, have you never seen a bird before? <laughs> Just to acknowledge that people are very cautious and they want to announce, they want to say, hey, I don't really know. So walking out of a training five hours later, how good are they? This is a bit of a wonky graph, and I'm going to um, just walk you through it 
on this X axis is previous experience. So each one of these dots is a coaster or a bunch of coasters together, a bigger dot is a bunch of people together. Um, and so this is how good they are, how accurate they are in identifying the carcass in front of them to species as a function of how many carcasses they've seen. So look here, out here, these are people that have seen a lot of carcasses, they have a lot of practice. Um, and people down here are just starting all the way down to you're just before your first carcass, you're just before your first survey. Right, so that's your theoretical starting point. And what would that be? That's about 70%. So we use fancy math to um, figure that out, which means that walking out of a training, you can get seven out of 10 carcasses correct to species. Pretty damn good. Better than a graduate student. <laughs> and then you can see that that line goes up. So you get better over time. Practice makes perfect. And that's the case with a lot of things, right? So after about a year, it's about 35 carcasses on average, varies from place to place. You can get up to about 87% on average, which means nine out of 10 carcasses, you get correct to species, which is fantastic. I mean, that's amazing. And the great thing about the COAST program is we can prove that. And that is because in addition to all the other evidence that are collected, uh, coasters take two photographs. And here you can see, see how easy it is to take a picture of a dead bird. Um, you can fill the front and you can also put a scale um, ruler in. And so we take a belly shot and a back shot of each carcass. And so that photo evidence together with the measurements and foot type and a bunch of other things, um, our data verifier who sits in a little darkened room in Seattle um, and verifies every single carcass that comes in in an average year, somewhere between about five and 8,000 carcasses. So turning in the data sheets, and unlike um, ISN, uh, uh, ECOS program, we actually still use paper. We use paper <laughs> marine. Um, we find that it's really great. If you drop it in the ocean, you can just pick it up, shake it <laughs> off, and use it again. Harder to do with a cell phone. Uh, uh, so it, it actually works in the rain as well, as the name implies. Um, so here's somebody actually um, filling in the data sheets. Okay, so so what? So we have a long-term program, and we train lots of people, we work with a lot of different communities. Everybody's out there surveying the beaches, finding dead birds, writing all of these data, sending them into the COAST program. It, it only goes into a digital drawer. Who cares? So this is what we do with the data. The most important thing that we do with the data is construct a baseline for an average, right? The long-term, the, the, climatolo the climatology of dead birds, um, mm -hmm. as, as Rick would say. So in fact, I'm gonna just use his analogy. This is the climatology, it's the long-term average, and the gray, that's the weather. Um, that's what happened in a particular month and year. Um, you're actually looking at a, um, a graph of the northern coast of Oregon, and I just use this because it's got a um, a really distinctive pattern. So some um, months of the year, we have a pretty high encounter rate. What's the encounter rate? That's just how many carcasses you would expect to find in a lineal kilometer of coastline if you search from the water's edge up to the vegetation and from a start point to a turnaround point. So you can see some months like May, um, May are low, and then some months like August, September, or November, December. So there's the long-term average of normal, there's the climatology of uh, dead birds in Oregon and um, what happened in any given year. So I can take that long-term average and I can print it over every single year and I can stretch out this graph and show you a few years together. Oh, actually, I'm lying to you. I'm not gonna do that. I switched, I switched these slides up. Okay, so what I can do is show you this. This is a, a pretty normal year. The gray bars and that long-term average kind of match each other, right? not the same every year. So here's a year that's pretty not normal, right? In which the gray bars are actually a lot higher. Um, this is the same average, but I've smushed it down because I had to accommodate these higher bars. So here in September, um, 14 carcasses per kilometer, so if we stretch that across all of that coastline in Northern Oregon, it's about 40,000 carcasses a day. That's a lot. Way not normal. Way not normal. This is like an extreme storm, right? This is a bird, bird apocalypse where we're getting more than 30 carcasses 
per kilometer, um, and we stretch that out, that's about 8,000 carcasses a day, day after day for a month, right? That's a lot. This is what's known um, in, in my lingo as a mass mortality event. Okay. And I want to tell you the story of a single mass mortality event um, in Alaska. And this is a story about common mirth. And as the name implies, they are pretty common. Um, they uh, breed from uh, California all the way on up um, into the Bering, although when they go north, that territory gets taken over by pistils, the guys with the little white milk mustache, the difference between them. Okay. So these are photographs from Whittier Beach that were taken on New Year's Day in 2016. Um, by actually the former head of the Threatened and Endangered Species Program in um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Region 10 office here. He wanted to go sailing with his family, but in fact, what he did instead um, and roped his kids into doing this is try to count all the birds on the beach, 6,000 carcasses in a kilometer. 6,000 carcasses in one day. So that's not an average, that's an uh, and because that beach is a little over a kilometer wide, they got about 8,000 from over 8,000 purposes. Um, that uh, event and some uh, events that have preceded it that, that weren't anywhere near as bad um, got everybody and their brother out counting purposes and all the posters out counting purposes. And we found 60,000 per purpose. Now that's unprecedented. That's, just, that's carcasses that people found. Imagine, I mean, think about the coastline uh, of Alaska from southeast around the Gulf and out the uh, peninsula in the oceans and over um, into the Bering. An incredible amount of real estate, almost all of which people can't get to, right? And yet in the places where people can get to, that's what we found. That's, a, that's an incredible count. What happened? Um, well, we had an extreme event. Um, we had a, a marine heat wave, um, which we coined the blob uh, in Washington state, a big lens of warmer than normal water that hung out in the Northeast Pacific, actually for a few years. Um, so big enough and long enough to change the ecosystem. And one thing that it did was it changed forage fish dynamics. So those small fish like herring or sardines where I live or sand lance um, on up here became less frequent and also smaller in size per year. At the same time, that warm water took big fish like pollock and made them warmer because they are the same temperature as the, warm, as the water. And warmer fish eat more. Right? So we made the big fish predators, well, we didn't. The, well, yes, we did. Um, <laughs> the warm water made those big fish predators kind of eat more of the ecosystem than they did before, right? So those, those bigger predators are eating fewer forage fish, right? Um, lots of predatory pressure. And the, the competing predators, seabirds in this case, lost out. So the fish are better at finding, big fish are better at finding forage fish than the MERS are, and so the MERS literally is. We now know that over 4 million of them lost their lives in that one. Okay. About 11 months, a lot of real estate, but 4 million MERS, that's depending on how you count it, 20 to 25% of the world's right, in, in one of them. That is a mass mortality. And it's not the only one. So I'm going to show you a timeline of mass mortality events. And each circle that I'm going to put is a different event. And the size of the circle tells you something about how big it was. So they're all scaled to each other so you can compare them. And they're going to be different colors. And those colors are going to correspond to different species. And I'll have little pictures of the major species. Because one of the things about mass mortality events, which is really interesting, is that it's predominantly one species yeah. or another species. So it's not everybody together, it's particular species. So in the start, before the water warmed, we had lots of different ones. Mass mortality events are normal. But once the water warmed, we got lots more bigger, uh, so more frequent. Um, and as the phenomena went north, we changed predominantly from alcids, common mers, Dr. puffins, rhinoceros auklets, to prosolarias, northern fulmars. Uh, and shearwaters, those are birds that breed in the southern hemisphere, but hang out here um, in the northern season. And you can see that difference. That difference happened when the ocean got stuck on 
And so we would talk about that a lot, but I will just go over that briefly. We had that, stop doing that. We had that marine heat wave um, up to four degrees centigrade, warmer than normal, of a size of a continental Canada, big, lasting for a few years long. Um, at the same time, and Rick also talked about this, we had a lot of loss of sea ice. That is a general phenomena, and I'm using the data that he advised against, but there it is. Um, right, a lot of loss of extent at the same time. Okay, so here's a trace of um, sea surface temperature anomaly, warmer or less warm than normal. I've only put the warmer side, and you can see three things happening here. One is that North Pacific uh, marine heat wave when the ocean got stuck on warm, but also the loss of Arctic ice and an El Nino on the backside. So lots of different physical phenomena coming together to really change the ecosystem. And when we look at that relative to mass mortality events, each one of these is a mass mortality event. Um, and we look at the magnitude of the event, um, how long, how big in space, how long in time, and how many carcasses per kilometer. You can see that there's a little step function. So here's the translation from the statistics. And that is when the ocean temperature is more than a degree above normal persisting, we're going to lose millions of birds because the ecosystem can't support them anymore. Right? Pretty bad. Okay, I'll just go through this. What can you do? Well, besides just going home and closing the door, you can get out and be part of the solution. So citizen science and community science are two great ways to do this. I invite you to be part of ISN um, and also part of the COAST team. Um, and you can do that by coming back tomorrow to uh, training we're holding for ISN and also for COAST um, on die-off alert, which is not the full COAST training. It's what do you do if you see dead birds on the beach? Um, and how can you get that data um, to us? Okay. What it means to participate is you take a card. It looks like this um, with you. Uh, you take your phone. You put the card down next to the carcasses. You sort them by species if there are a bunch of them. I brought dead bird parts with me to travel with bird parts in my <laughs> um, So we can uh, play at that tomorrow. Okay, so here are eight reasons that Coast Beach Bird makes a difference. I've told you about climate impacts, but we do lots of other stuff. Real spill modeling, harmful algal bloom work, changes in predator distribution, fishery bycatch, disease outbreaks, um, marine debris, and habitat change. Thanks for listening. All right, hello everyone, good morning. Um, my name is Cecil Smith. Um, I was raised on the, uh, the lands of the Akuna tribe outside of Anchorage, and I'm thrilled to be here today with you. Um, I'm part of the Northern Latitudes Partnerships, and I'll be talking more in depth about two programs that Hannah Marie briefly mentioned in her presentation, the Fish Map app and So a little background on the NLP, the Northern Latitudes Partnerships is comprised of three regional partnerships, the Aleutian and Bering Sea Initiative, Western Alaska Partnership and Northwest Boyer Partnership. And each of these regional partnerships are directed by a steering committee um, that includes representatives from state and federal agencies, tribes, First Nations, indigenous organizations, nonprofits, universities, and others. Um, and sort of, you know, with our sort of broad collective impact approach, have over 150 partners across Alaska and Northwest Canada, um, as the Northwest Boyer Partnership extends to territories in Canada. Um, and the NLP uh, is sort of built on years of work and trust and collaboration that were initiated um, by the Landscape Conservation Cooperatives, which some of you may be familiar with, um, but um, next slide. Uh, so the LCCs were established by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service back in 2010 um, and existed with Jane's Fish and Wildlife for a number of years. Um, in 2017, um, the staff funding for the LCCs, which is a network um, of LCCs uh, across the United States, um, including the handful in Alaska, um, 
so the funding was pulled in 2017, but um, the sort of trade committees and partners of the LTCs in Alaska got together and really committed to continuing the work um, that these uh, uh, conservation cooperatives have been doing um, to support um, the transition of these uh, LTCs away from Fish and Wildlife Service through a number of different iterations. Um, we're now sort of formally the Northern Latitude Partnerships as opposed to LTCs um, and housed um, the San Alaska Conservation Foundation and the Fish and Wildlife Service. So in particular, the Western Alaska Partnership of the most relevant to folks here in this room um, has recently gone through a number of transformations um, and is back and sort of in the stages of redefining who we are as a partnership, what we want our focuses to be, et cetera. So if you're interested, um, you know, we're, we're looking for any and all individuals, organizations, et cetera, who want to be a part of this Western Alaska partnership. Um, our next meeting is going to be in just a couple weeks um, and it will be virtual. And then we'll have an in person gathering um, sometime in the fall, most likely in Kodiak where Nisa Russell, who's the partnership coordinator lives. Um, so if you have any questions, if you wanna get involved, learn more about any of those meetings, please reach out to her. Okay, so the first program that I'll be talking about today is the Alaska Fish Habitat Mapping App, also sort of quippily known as the Fish Map App, fun to say. Um, so I'll ask Tab to play a video for y'all really quick. Um, I think if you hit the link, Oh no. You can just go to yeah. <laughs> Technical difficulty. Oh no. I was on it. Oh. Oh no. Oh, there's a missing A. Alas. Then it's just going to be this first video here. Oh, yeah, sure. Don't forget to share sound. Don't forget to share sound. Optimize for video clip. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Nice. Good. Um, I'm doing it, guys. Not that I've done this a million times. Salmon, Dolly Varden, hooligan, whitefish. From the sea to freshwater spawning habitat. Anadromous fish mean a lot to Alaskans. Protecting fish habitat means protecting the well-being of our communities, way of life, and ecosystems. Culturally, it's a part of the staple diet for many of the indigenous people here in Alaska. Yeah, salmon, you know, it, it's the number one species that we rely on in, in this area. It's really common for people, native and not native, to be out fishing in the summertime to get their, their share of their fish. Oh, uh oh. Buffer. Fish for the winter. And then economically, Alaska is huge in the fishing industry. So it's one of those really important uh, resources that we have here in Alaska. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game is tasked with documenting water bodies that are important habitat for the spawning, rearing, or migration of anadromous fish in the Anadromous Waters Catalog and Atlas, or AWC. Streams and lakes specified in the AWC are afforded protections under the Anadromous Fish Act. Despite ongoing efforts to add water bodies to the AWC, significant gaps in its coverage remain, particularly in remote and difficult to access regions of Alaska. Now, you can join the effort to fill in those habitat gaps. Through a new, easy-to-use smartphone app, you can submit observations while you're out on the land. So having this app be a way to get boots on the ground and have people be the power and the data um, is pretty unique in order to help fill that data gap and, and get more information about the natural waters and streams and fish species that are there. And so with climate change and the shifts that are occurring and the environment changing in ways that we can't keep up with. This is another way to showcase and track that. It has all the regions in here, Arctic, interior, south central, southeast, southwest, and west. By helping to map where these fish exist, all you need to do is find some fish, fill out a few simple data fields, collect photos, Go and right. hit submit. And hit save. I think that this is one of those tools that I hope we can use to crowdsource this data. 
because there are people who go places that I have never been, even on this island. I've been to a lot of places on this island. You know, we got a lot of trappers around here. You know, people that just go out and sightsee and and try to go to remote areas where people haven't been. And I think they would love to use that. Here's the kicker. Submit an observation that the Alaska Department of Fish and Game approves as new data, and we'll send you money to reward your efforts. We're hoping to solve the challenge of uncatalogued fish habitat by learning from the people that know the land best, you. So whether we're talking about the economic benefit of protecting the habitat of anatomous fish or the cultural benefit or the everyday recreational joy that we get by utilizing these streams and rivers, um, it's important to all Alaskans. This app could change a lot of what we do and how we see the interaction between the forests and the streams and the fish in the forest. I mean, there are so many species that, that all play a part in order to have a proper functioning ecosystem. We've been able to harness what we harvest from the land. You know, we don't cultivate the land. You know, the land cultivates us. This app was made possible through a collaboration between the Indigenous Sentinels Network, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and the Northern Latitudes Partnerships. I forgot how much Hannah Marie was in that video, so. <laughs> okay, so last year, 2022, um, was the launch of the app. It was our first pilot season, and we focused a lot on doing a lot of key outreach, and um, the initial pilot of the app, which was piloted by the Yakutat Tribe, Prince of Wales Tribal Conservation District, Forest Service, I believe, Petersburg and Wrangell, um, to just sort of, you know, get the app moving, get feedback, make sure it's working. And, and as Hannah Marie mentioned, it led to a handful of nominations. Um, and then moving into this season um, for 2023, we're continuing to try and do that key partner outreach, get more folks involved, get more folks to download the app, particularly in rural and western Alaska, um, so that, you know, people who are actually out on the land are using this app, um, learning how to use it, and uh, hopefully helping us get the AWC updated. Um, so this is your excuse to pull out your phone during this presentation. Right now, if you text the word FISH to this phone number, 855-736-4949, um, you'll get an automated response that allows you to pick any community, any region of the state, and it will send you the current version of the Natural Waters Catalog for that region. So you could pick Dillingham, you could pick your hometown, wherever you're zooming in from, anywhere um, to see uh, what waters are currently in the AWC. And you may look at it and immediately say, hey, I know that there are naturally fish in a body of water that's not currently blue. Um, and then you can go download the app and submit a nomination. Um, so if you want, have any questions, if you want to schedule a group training, um, anything like that, please feel free to reach out to NISA um, or visit the website at alaskafishmapping.org. Um, so the other partnership um, program that I'll be talking about with ISN um, is the Skipper Science Partnership, um, which focuses on connecting fishermen um, to scientific researchers across the state. Um, so in addition to the many folks listed on the previous slide, um, you know, a large group of over 15 organizations have come together to support this project. So thank you to all of those folks. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so the Skipper Science Partnership um, aims to center communities in fisheries management by connecting fishermen and scientists in order to build, in order to support resilient fisheries and build trust. Um, so as mentioned, it's um, originated out of the Indigenous Sentinels Network, which Hannah Marie just talked about, um, and started just a couple years ago. Um, we had our pilot season in 2021, um, and is a method for you know folks who are out on the water to collect data, um, share environmental observations, um, all kinds of things with researchers um, so that that data can be collected and used to inform management decisions. Um, so since it's part of the ISN, it comes with all of those great benefits as does the Fish Map app that Hannah Marie mentioned in terms of there being a lot of support, both technical and communi um, communication um, support. Um, you can use it you know, out on your boat. You don't have to have Wi-Fi or data signal in order to submit an observation. 
Um, and there are lots of venues for you to share that information with other members of your community, um, as well as people who are, uh, you know, making decisions that uh, affect your time out on the water, your livelihood, et cetera. Um, so there are lots of different types of observations that can be recorded through the Skipper Science app. Um, and they range from, you know, general environmental conditions to um, any sightings of marine mammals, seabirds, um, any abnormalities you notice, um, whether that's, oh, I've never seen this in this area, or I'm seeing this way earlier than I'm used to, um, anything like that, um, as well as, you know, things like sea ice, algal blooms, seaweeds, kelp, et cetera. Um, so our 2022 season report is complete and fully available on the website. Um, a few highlights, we had over 150 fishermen sign on to, to participate. Um, in the past season, whether that be through submitting observations, participating in our workshops, or participating in a pilot study that we launched last year that um, focused on the stomach contest with black cod. Um, so this type of fo focused research project um, is sort of you know, where this program um, wants to go. We all want to be a place to gather you know, any kind of observation that skippers are collecting, but um, really sort of excited about moving forward into an area with more uh, targeted research projects that are really directly used to inform management decisions. Um, and those can come from either direction, whether that be like trends that skippers are noticing or specific questions that researchers have that they wanna gather more data about. Um, so we have this black cod project that I just mentioned. Um, it could also be you know, focused on specific seabird interactions, um, uh, specific gathering of environmental data, such as water temperature, et cetera or focusing in on specific marine mammal species of interest um, and gathering data about those. So if you want to get involved, you can go to skipperscience.org. Um, you can download the Skipper Science app from the Google Play or the Apple Store, whatever this QR code will take you to the website, um, or you can reach out to Anne Marie, who just spoke, um, if you have any other questions. So with that, um, <coughs> Diana, thank you. Um, are there any questions? I do have one on this on the app for the AWC. Mm -hmm. uh, again, used to require two fishing hands. Uh, is that still the case? And how does that work, uh, particularly way in the upper areas that most people don't get? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, actually. I don't right now. I, um, I believe we, uh, we co designed the protocol for fishing beans. So I think we are doing a single fishing beans what Joe Beaver and Fish and Bean told us, um, but it's also multiple pictures. So we can touch back base with that, but he's been guiding us in the types of pictures for the nominations that are required and the information there. Who determines life stage and all that, because they do sort of segment yeah. out stage. Yeah, the life stages is something that's recorded in the app too. And so do we have it in writing that they'll take yeah. one yeah. fish in hand? Yeah. yeah. And it's it's very explicitly laid out in the app as well. It'll tell you exactly what information. And so some of us have been electrofishing over the years and only got one fish in hand. We can go back to those and now get them in the catalog. The catalog. That's kind of the bridging process that's part of this program. And they funded it in our, our we have the weekly workshops, not weekly, sorry, monthly workshop at the end of the season that help kind of work through the process, what work, what information is still missing. Um, and we help facilitate that. So we can definitely chat with well, I can get the fish habitat partnership. And what about the other species of fish? Because they also have the freshwater, the freshwater fish inventory. That's something that I was actually having a great, I don't know if it's in the room, conversation with Todd and the customer. Um, and we think we can add an, easily add another page to just collect more species information. Um, as we, CJ mentioned, this just launched last summer, so we wanted to start with just the specific protocol for AWC. But I think it would be amazing to expand it to other freshwater species and include that ability to collect information about them. Uh, just a uh, just a quick rounder. Um, if you all are up uh, stretching legs and stuff, um, for the uh, perhaps in the back, make sure you stop by and also the upscore table as you move around. Um, and you're welcome and, and warm by this wonderful crowd as well. And um, at lunch, um, 
whenever uh, that takes place, um, we're going to have uh, poster presentations set up uh, here on this wall and here. And uh, so make sure that uh, at lunch you don't run off for too long and come back and see the vendors and uh, ask plenty of great questions to our poster presenters. Next couple talks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Absens. I work with the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, a non point source water group within the water quality section within the Division of Water. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first thing I'm going to do is try to introduce you to the non point source group, what we do, because if you're like me, before I worked at EEC, I would have had no idea what non point source water quality group. Division of Water, like what all that meant. So I'm going to start just doing that. And then I'm going to go talk about a couple projects that we're doing in the region and then uh, get in depth at this film ham pathogens monitoring project that's been going on uh, last year and will be occurring this year as well. Uh, so, next slide. Uh, so, yeah, what is the non point source group? So, we're in DEC. DEC is a pretty big organization. There's a couple different branches or divisions. So I'm with the Division of Water. There's also a Division of Air. There's a Division of Storage Spots. And there's a Division of Environmental Health. Um, so within the Division of Water, there's the Water Quality Group. And then there's also Compliance and Discharge Authorization. So just start, Discharge Authorization is like permits. Compliance is the people who make sure people are doing what their permit says. <laughs> and then there's Water Quality. So then it's like, well, well what does Water Quality do? So within water quality, there's a non-point source, there's a monitoring group, there's water quality standards, and then engineering support. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about engineering support, but if you've ever installed a septic tank or done any of that and you're familiar with the qualified or certified installer program in the state of Alaska, it's housed under that program. Uh, water quality standards is more policy. Um, the state of Alaska has water quality standards that are issued by the EPA and we have to follow those and we have to report on how our water is meeting those standards or not. Um, then there's a monitoring group and then there's a non-point source group. So now the next layer down, that's the non-point source group. That's where I am. And, then, and uh, so what do we do? We address non-point source pollution. And it's like, okay, that's cool. So how do we do that? Um, targeted, we do a lot of targeted monitoring. Uh, we do outreach planning efforts to protect and restore waters. And when I say restore waters, I'm talking about um, the impaired waters. So those are waters on the EPA's 303D impaired waters list. So we manage those. We create uh, restoration programs for them um, and that kind of stuff. So uh, next slide. Um, so targeted monitoring. Uh, we do some of the work ourselves. These are just some pictures of some uh, projects that we've done. <laughs> These are usually um, in high priority waters where there's been an identified data gap, and we have the resources and we can get out there and go and do the monitoring ourselves. This doesn't happen super often, so I'll say that you know there's four people in my group, and we have to cover the entire state of Alaska. Um, so it, you know people who work with smaller entities, like it's impossible to physically be everywhere and monitor every water body you want to monitor. Um, so we do some internal stuff, but we also do a lot of external work. Um, and we accomplish that with a couple of different tools. So next slide. And our tools are contracts, brands, and partnerships. Um, so here's some examples, contracts. Uh, we'll periodically put open bid contracts out. Um, you can access them from the online public notices at the State of Alaska um, Notices Board. These kind of come up when there's an issue that we want to address, uh, funding becomes available, and um, it's not within a, one of our grant cycles. So a couple examples are, we did a big watershed prioritization modeling project with the University of Alaska Anchorage GIS's program. Uh, they took a bunch of uh, publicly available data and um, put it over, I think, Hub 12 watershed model and like help prioritize. So that was kind of like an internal tool, but you can access the web map uh, at our web page. Um, 
The other contract we did was this big statewide marine ports shipping lanes monitoring project. Um, so there's a 2020 report that's available on our web page. They're doing this project again this year and they'll be doing it the next couple of years. But they're going out to all the major harbors and ports throughout the state. So uh, Unalaska, Juneau, um, Seward, Port of Anchorage, um, a couple, half a dozen more, and they're doing water quality standards, heavy metal, nutrients, uh, bacteria, and they're kind of surveying all those. Uh, Billingham was not part of this project. Um, but again, that's going on. And then the Billingham Bacteria Monitoring Project that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but you can go to the next one. Uh, this is the main tool we use uh, as Alaska Clean Water Action Grants. So DEC uh, manages aqua grants in collaboration with Fish and Game and DNR. Um, but these are grants that are two-year projects. Um, they have to address non-point source pollution. We hand out a lot of grants, usually in four categories. It's education and outreach, uh, monitoring, um, uh, BMP implementation. Usually that's taken green infrastructure installations, but you know that can be kind of creatively interpreted, especially in like colder climates. Um, and then uh, I always forget the last one, it's planning. Um, so watershed plans, watershed protection plans. Um, these are two-year grants. Um, we just had a grant RFP last fall. Um, we have the 2023-2025 projects starting up right now. Uh, the next RFP will be 2024. Um, we gave about, um, I think our total pool of funds this year was about a million dollars, which sounds like a lot, but we funded like 14, 15 different projects across the state. So these are kind of smaller packets of funds, but they're really good for, like, if you wanted to do some scoping or planning work for maybe like a bigger grant down the road and you just want to get some initial data or like start a protection plan, that's something you could use this for, um, or start some outreach. So um, some projects that are coming up in the 2023-2025 project cycle. Um, sea Grant has uh, Aqua Grant. Um, CAV's uh, previous project, um, his previous Aqua Grant fellowship, or fellowship with Sea Grant was funded. Originally it was an Aqua Grant, then became a contract, but it was funded through some of our funding. Um, and he helped us with the Clean Harbors Program. So, working with TAB again to get another Sea Grant fellow to hopefully um, kind of put some more energy behind the, Ala behind the uh, Alaska Clean Harbors Program and kind of expand that effort. Um, and then we're also working with the Chignik Tribal Council to do a sub-regional watershed protection plan on Chignik. Um, on the map over here, just from our website, you can see the locations of previous offer grants where they've been granted. Um, a lot of them are centered around Anchorage and Juneau, primarily because that's where we've had people working in those positions. It's easy to see things in your backyard versus farther out. So we're trying to uh, spread out more across the state, but that's an ongoing effort. Um, so you can do the next one. And then partnerships, uh, like our staff. So I'm located in Kenai, Soldatna, so I work a lot with our um, uh, the Kenai Watershed Forum and a couple of the other groups down there to help with long-term monitoring, to help with outreach. Um, this picture is from an outreach event with the uh, Fish and Game down in Kenai. Uh, it's the Alaska or the Alaska Salmon Celebration. Uh, it's held every May, and this is my colleague Jenny, who's showing she's working with a watershed demonstration project. So this is coming up in May. It was four hours. Last year, 900 kids showed up, and I did not know there was that many kids on the Kenai Peninsula. <laughs> so this year, I'm I'm starting to get mentally prepped. <laughs> Four hours of just constant, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I think we talked to a lot of kids, had a lot of great experience, got sticky somehow, you know. I don't know. Um. So. But we do a lot of outreach. Uh, we partner a lot with people in our areas for outreach and then uh, regional work groups like fish habitat programs, um, uh, mountains to sea, those type of programs. We do a lot of work in that. 
Um, so that's our last tool. So next one. Um, so this is a project that's ongoing. Uh, this is a two-year monitoring contract, 2022 to 2023. So it, the first year happened last, or the first year was last year, and they're going to be coming out again. Uh, Alaska Water Labs out of Wasilla applied for this and was granted the contract for this. Um, this fits into kind of a broader statewide effort to monitor pathogens in what we call recreational waters. And it's part of the Alaska Beach Program. It's related to a program in the lower 48 called the EPA and Beaches Program, which was actually developed in the Great Lakes um, because they were having higher incidences of um, waterborne illnesses and swimmers and recreational uh, at recreational beaches. Um, so that kind of expanded up to Alaska. So recreation in Alaska doesn't necessarily mean what it does in lower 48, but still fishing, boating, uh, being in an environment where you might get splashes of water in the water. Um, that's where this beach program kind of fits in. Um, so it's part of a broader statewide effort. We have we've had beach programs in uh, Kenai and Kitchikan and Kuna. This year we're getting one going in Kodiak with the Kodiak Native Association um, or Kana, and then we're also doing one in Skagway. Um, this Dillingham was monitored back in like 2014, I think. And then NACNAC was also monitored as part of that project. So they collected pathogen samples in the past, um, but we haven't been out here in like 10 years. So this is kind of an effort to get like, to see if anything's changed in the past 10 years and then put it potentially into this beach program. But so Alaska Water Labs is doing this. It's just testing ambient water quality uh, for pathogens and drogtoxi and fecal coliform. Um, these are bacteria that are found in the intestines of warm blooded animals. So people, birds, dogs, horses, moose, whatever. Um, they had eight sampling events in 2022. They're sampling May through August. So ice free uh, summer months. Uh, we also, or they also took two microbial source tracking samples. So, um, this is a test that you can do to uh, use quantitative PCR to then look at the, bac the bacteria in your sample and then figure out the host organism. Um, so it's pretty useful. And then eventually all the data will be compared against the state water quality criteria. So that's Title 18 of the Alaska Administrative Code, Section 70. You can always look that up afterwards. It's fun reading. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah. So these are monitoring sites. These were based off of that 2014 monitoring. Uh, so the one up near Snake Point kind of drifted at the time that I put this presentation together. So it's not in the middle of town. It's mm -hmm. kind of out, um, yeah, like right here. And then Scandinavian Beach right outside the harbor and then Kanaknak. Um, and again, these were historic sites. They're sites where the contractor could get their sampler out safely and get back to the airport. So the tricky thing with bacteria samples is that they have a holding time of eight hours. So you have to collect them and then get them incubating on your tray within eight hours. Here it is tricky. So they came up with this system where they would have their person fly out, um, spend the night, and then the next day, time it with when the flight leaves and go collect all their samples, get on the flight with their little cooler, and then get to Anchorage, jump in a car, and then drive to Wasilla within, uh, our goal usually was say six in the field, two in the lab. And so six out, so that cuts that eight hours even back shorter because it gives a lab two hours to process the sample and prep it. Um, but they've been able to meet that whole time. They've hit it like about six hours right on the nose every time. Um, but so those are sample sites. Um, these are the 2022 results. Uh, so I have the three locations uh, far to the left here. And then we have the enterococci results um, and then the fecal coliform. So MPN is most probable number, uh, CFU is called form forming units. Um, and here's just averages of standard deviations. It's like, okay, well, like, what does that mean? So 
um, compare that. So what we did is just compared it to our state water quality standards. So again, that title 18 Alaska Administrative Code Section 70. Fun stuff. So we have contact recreation. So that's primary contact. That's like swimming where you're going to get water in your, or on your body. And then secondary contact, that's kind of like boating or fishing where you might be like splashing water on yourself at some point. And this last one we'll talk about in a second, but basically um, there were in 2022 at all the sites, there was no exceedance of the state water quality standard for contact re recreation or secondary contact recreation, which is great. The last one over here is for harvest and consumption of raw fish and shellfish. So that's sushi. It did exceed that, but that I would say is site we had these like intertidal like near shore areas especially around um habitated you know areas people have septic tanks they have dogs those type of things it did exceed this so um i would say just follow safe food handling practices like rinse your catch uh cook your catch the usda recommends cooking fish and shellfish to an internal temperature of 145 um which is I have to say that because that's what they recommend. I think America's Test Kitchen uh, says like salmon should be cooked to like 125 or else you're just gonna like um, dry it out. But <laughs> yeah, my official statement recommends <laughs> cooking fish and shellfish to internal temperature. <laughs> so that's that. Uh, next slide. Um, so the microbial source tracking. So again, this was like looking at the bacteria that were, they were collecting and then identifying the host. Um, you have to have host markers to compare it against. So it kind of limits on what host we can look at. So we did, or so they did a human host, a gull host, which I think includes like ducks and seabirds. Um, so I know like the coast people are like, oh my God, a gull is not a duck. And stuff like that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, yeah. For this, oh yeah, we'll just say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, and so they don't have host markers currently for a lot of marine mammals because a lot of people use this tool in the lower 48, and you're not really concerned about crabbers and like a beluga poop and that kind of stuff. So we don't have a marine mammal host marker yet. Um, but anyway, so I'll talk about we did do human goal and they collected samples for MSP twice. So, um, the horizontal mark is detected, but not quantified. So that's like super, super low levels. The check mark is detected quantifiable. That is, we definitely have poop from said organism. And then an X is not detected. So on June 28th, um, there was a detected human, but not quantifiable at Snake Point. Didn't show up anywhere else. Didn't show up anywhere on July 12th. Gull shows up everywhere. Yeah, uh, except for more on July 28th versus July 12th. So we kind of have an idea that maybe gulls slash ducks slash seabirds might be a contributor. But again, we don't have, we didn't run hosts for dogs. We didn't run hosts for ungulates. We didn't have hosts for marine mammals. So there could be other contributors. It's just that, again, these are the ones that we had. And this is kind of what a little bit of the story that teased out right now. Uh, so next slide. So next steps, again, this is a two-year project. So they're gonna just repeat the 2022 sampling design in 2023. Again, that title 18, eight, and I think I said 17 before, it's title 18 AAC section 70. Compare, uh, then they're gonna do some outreach. Our contractor's supposed to do outreach. We'll see how that goes. Um, and then 2022 season report is available on our webpage. We have a DC, DEC. Water quality reports page is kind of buried. Right now, I should have put a QR code. That was a great idea. I've seen that on a bunch of presentations. But um, if you need help finding it, just I can direct you to it at some point. Just grab me while I'm here. So, um, but yeah, that's it. And then uh, questions. So, my supervisor, uh, I direct all your questions to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
sent me here. So <laughs> I'm glad to be here. It's really cool. But um, yeah, so uh, Laura is my supervisor. And then there's my contact information. Um, again, I'm located in the Soldatna, Soldatna Kenai office. And I'll be working with Tab a little bit the next year, hopefully, with our awesome Sea Grant fellow who's going to take the pro Clean Harbors program off the ground. So yeah, that's it. Question. So you don't do any PSP testing, right? So it's environmental health. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's environmental health. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's a, uh, yeah. So the paralytic shellfish poisoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, environmental health, um, which is funny, like drinking water is also environmental health. Drinking water is not the division of water, which is weird. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I worked in environmental health. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were like, Oh, you good? Thank you. Okay. You guys are doing great. This is the last one before lunch. Whoa. Sorry. Last one before lunch. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Ben. Uh, I work for a nonprofit in Anchorage. I'm originally from Cordova. Um, uh, this nonprofit I work for, is, our goal is to support the needs of the fishing industry in Alaska. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about today. All right, so I think we got a bunch of animations here. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I was uh, touring through the uh, touring through the local Fred Myers in Anchorage before I left. Um, I was looking at the freezer section and then the canned fish section, and really looking at okay, what are like the labels? What are these little icons that these companies have placed on these fish packages? Um, yeah, there's a whole range of them you see. Some of them are kind of made up um, by the packager. This Trident Seafoods one or this one on the um, fish probably don't mean anything. It's just uh, made in Alaska. This one, you see this probably more than any of the others. It's the ASME logo, um, Alaska Seafood. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about this MSC logo. Um, it's uh, yeah, definitely a big, uh, big controversial topic for Alaska. Um, so Alaska uses two different certifications uh, for its seafood, uh, MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council, and then RFM, which is a, um, it started in Alaska, but it's a, kind of an alternative to MSC. Um, Alaska has a bunch of certified fisheries. Uh, the ones in red are the ones that the group I work for represents. Um, and I've worked on a, I think all of these at this point um, in my one year fellowship. Uh, so when uh, fisheries certified, it's not just, um, certified as a whole. It's certified in like all the different gear groups. So in Alaska, we have like a hundred different salmon fisheries that have been certified, uh, including Bristol Bay, um, Prince William Sound Pink, Southeast Chum. Um, currently all the salmon fisheries in Alaska are certified by um, both MSC and RFM, which is I think a really good thing for, uh, for marketing purposes. Um, so I think I, I first learned about MSC from that documentary, uh, Seaspiracy a couple of years ago. Um, but people that are more involved with the fishing industry have known about it for quite a while. Um, here's some shots from 2013. This is um, outside the Walmart in Anchorage. These are local Cordovans uh, protesting the shift um, of Walmart to require MSC certified seafood. Um, and this, this, this concern is because Alaska is really proud of it, how it manages its seafood. And um, we, to get MSC, you have to pay a lot of money to this foreign group to essentially uh, approve Alaska of doing its a good job, uh, which we already know we're doing. Um, so I think uh, when you look at the costs and benefits, um, MSC is really expensive. Uh, it's like $100,000 supply to get certified. Um, some of these uh, groups like uh, OBI that produce a lot more seafood, um, they pay huge royalty fees to MSC, um, the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, to get certified, it's weeks and months of uh, staff time from ADF and D and the group I work for. And then most importantly, I think um, in Alaska, there's a lot of uh, concern over outside pressures uh, telling us what to do with our fisheries. Um, there are a lot of benefits to it, uh, specifically access to foreign markets. Uh, Germany requires all of its seafoods to be um, MSC certified. Um, and then for the consumer, I think it's informative to know, okay, what's a, what's a friendly option? Um, and then I, I just pulled this off the Wikipedia page. I thought this was a really nice. Uh, as description, um, this MSC process uh, harnesses market forces to incentivize uh, positive environmental change. 
Um, and I, I do believe this. I think there's been some good examples of this going on in Alaska. Uh, so I started working on this process um, in the summer. Um, in December, we had the fourth uh, surveillance audit of um, Alaska salmon. So um, uh, currently, Alaska salmon is MSC certified up until May, so uh, May 2024. So for the next couple of years, they'll be um, kind of reviewing the fishery and the information we provided. Um, Alaska salmon was the second fishery in the world to be certified. Currently, I think there's over 300. Um, so it's a really historic fishery. And it's kind of tracked, um, this story of um, certification is kind of tracked with uh, a lot of concerns about the uh, sustainability of hatcheries in Alaska. Um, so uh, around 2000, there was a concern um, published by University of Washington professors over um, the sustainability of the pink salmon hatcheries in Prince William Sound. And that led to the formation of this project uh, in around 2011, um, looking at, um, yeah, the interactions of pink salmon in Prince William Sound um, with wild fish. Um, and I started working on this project actually in 2013, right out of high school. So it's a pretty personal, <laughs> personal issue. Uh, so um, coming into this 2022 audit, uh, MSC kind of uh, informed us of, the, us of their two big concerns. Uh, principally, it was the effect and extent of straying hatchery salmon in Alaska. And then secondarily, um, the, uh, there was some concern over merlet bycatch and gillnet fisheries. Um, um, there's these two different merlets. Um, to me, they're indistinguishable. I don't want to get <laughs> Yeah, kit, kit slits and marlets, um, merlets, uh, marbled merlets are ESA listed in Oregon, so uh, that applies to the whole extent of the habitat range. So uh, I'm going to start talking about the uh, um, hatchery issue, um, which I wrote like a 60 page report summarizing to provide to MSC. I'll say um, what I say here is the views of uh, this group I work for, and not specifically ADF and G. Um, and what I've presented today is all publicly available. <laughs> There's uh, scientific publications. You can find preliminary results. Um, but yeah, I don't work for ADF&G, but I am a really big fan of this project. So um, this project started in 2011, um, and it had three main goals. Uh, what's the stock structure of pink salmon and chum salmon? Uh, what's the extent and, and variability of straying? So straying is when a hatchery fish is born, and then two to five years later, it comes back to not to the hatchery, but to a wild system, and then potentially interbreeds with wild fish. And then what's the impact of that interbreeding on wild populations? So this work was um, contracted out uh, to the Prince William Sound Science Center and the Sicka Sound Science Center. Um, I started working on this project in 2015 uh, in Prince William Sound. Um, and then right now, uh, all the uh, lab work is being done in Anchorage. So here's a little uh, project, here's a little video from 2017. These are yeah hundreds of pink salmon we collected uh, hundreds of dead pink salmon we collected and we're pulling out the uh, otolith uh, which is an ear bone um, and then a piece of the heart they use for genetic parentage analysis um, yeah we collected I think over the course of this whole project it was like a, a quarter million of these samples of fish collected pretty amazing uh, project um, so over the course of the project it'll cost around 17 million dollars. Um, it's currently on year 13 right now. Um, it's kind of interesting. It was principally funded by the fishing industry. So um, all the hatchery organizations as well as PSPA um, and federal organizations. Um, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting uh, project in that sense. It's been this nice collaboration between um, government and the fishing industry. Um, so I'll get into the results here. Um, there's a paper published in 2021. Um, they looked at samples from 2013 to 2015. Um, this is Prince William Sound. Uh, I'm from a community located right here. Um, the red on this graph is um, hatchery strays and the blue are uh, wild fish. And these are organized by fishing district in Prince William Sound. Um, really the, the main concern here is the Southwest district. Um, you can see about 37% of all the fish in all of these wild systems are hatchery strays, which is pretty amazing when you think about the amount of streams in this region. Uh, most of the pink salmon in Prince William Sound come from the uh, Eastern District, and uh, the stray percentage is less than 3%. And kind of a, an interesting result from this was they found that um, uh, 94 to 99% of all the fish that are entering Prince William Sound are harvested. So it's really this 6% that's causing this big, uh, this big problem. Um, 
so uh, in terms of the actual uh, impact of this strain, um, there's been this genetic parentage analysis and they found that hatchery strays produce around one half the offspring of wild fish. Um, and their behavior in the stream is a little bit different too. Um, for some reason, hatchery fish spawn further upstream. Um, hatchery fish are blue here, wild fish are red. And they also spawn later in the season, um, again, blue and red. So you can see the peaks are a little bit different. And uh, even after they account for these um, behavioral differences, there's still um, a big difference in fitness um, for the amount of offspring produced. Um, it's kind of amazing that um, some of these streams are like 60% hatchery fish, and they've probably been that way for 20 years, but you still see this effect um, in, in new strays that immigrate. Um, yeah. uh, so um, before I switch the subject here, uh, I'll just uh, put a plug in for pink salmon, probably not the most popular salmon in this region, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's this interesting thing going on in the Arctic right now. Um, yeah, there's like uh, pink salmon that were released in Norway that have kind of spread over the Arctic and started to meet up with pink salmon that come from Alaska, um, and they're essentially meeting in the middle here in Canada. So I think already we have circumpolar spawning pink salmon. And um, yeah, of course, positively correlated with climate change. Uh, yeah, they've explored a pink salmon fishery in Nome. I think um, Alaska uh, will be canning a lot of pink salmon in the upcoming decades. Uh, so some other projects I've worked on, um, this is the seabirds. Um, uh, we looked into a little fishing um, activity in Prince William Sound in the Southeast and tried to quantify the spatial overlap of gillnet fisheries and whale habitat and really like identified some areas of concern. Um, specifically, this Port Chalmers fishery was one of the regions we looked at. Um, and this work actually um, uh, led to a collaboration with ISN uh, using the Skipper Science app to uh, try to quantify merlet sightings in Southeast Alaska. Another um, project I've worked on, um, kind of more relevant to this region, um, is uh, looking at uh, the spatial impact, the spatial footprint of the halibut longline fishery. So doing the same kind of quantification, okay, like where's all the halibut being caught in Alaska? And then how does this um, overlay with sensitive coral habitats? Um, and really trying to pick out some areas of concern, specifically Kodiak Island seems like a big, uh, big problem area in terms of uh, spatial impact of the fishery. Um, so kind of takeaways from this work, um, I came into this a little bit, uh, um, I guess negative about MSC. Um, it came out, I think, uh, I think it is a positive force for Alaska. Um, and just working in this project has been a really great way to learn about the different fisheries in Alaska. Um, so that's, uh, I, think I'll, I got one more slide. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear people's thoughts here about the MSC program. Uh, thanks, Tab, for the invite and uh, EPSCOR for the travel funding. Um, if you want to see a little silly video I made about the, the Hatchery Wild project, you can YouTube that. Um, but yeah, thanks for your uh, time. Were all those dead fish were they spawned or were they just uh yeah, they all spawned? Yeah, yeah. thanks, doesn't matter. Yeah, they all spawned, so not didn't impact the fish also. Well, Emily, I'm curious. So if you're doing this hatchery stray thing, is if there's too much straying, is MSC maybe gonna decertify that fishery or, or how's yeah. that weighing into that? How they analyze whether it's sustainable. Yes, great. Yeah, they have a they have a strain string threshold, which um Princeton sound is over that, that string threshold. I think um, yeah, I mean, right now it's really hard to say, like uh, uh I mean I'm not privy to the internal dialogue going on at MSC, but um it seems like they'll wait until ADF and G has concluded the study to, to make this decision on the on the fishery. So yeah, it's kind of it's like 50%, it's like so you have 50% fitness of a hatchery fish. It's like it's halfway between zero and one. So it's like, yeah, it'll be really, it's a judgment call of MSC. And yeah. so I don't have a better answer, but. Well, isn't the larger issue also competition with wild fish in the ocean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, so for this this audit, um, that wasn't one of MSC's um, concerns, but they did bring it up. And I think in the next in the next set of audits will be brought up. And Fish and Game, like as a follow-up to this hatchery straying study, their next big 10-year project is a marine competition study. Um, which I personally I think is a bigger issue than strain. Yeah. yeah. How would you do that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, there's this uh, international year of salmon, um, so trawling, trawling in the ocean, yeah. trying to find species. Yeah. 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 yeah.
ったら捕まかわしそうな。<笑><笑>